Welcome to the OT. I'm Elise Jesse, and your Cincinnati Bengals are two and three. They've had this is going to be their fourth road game in five weeks. We're only in week six, and I would say that they're not too happy with that record. Who would be losing on last minute plays? That's happened to them three different times so far this season, and the season is still young. I would certainly say that this week against New Orleans is a must win for the Cincinnati Bengals, especially to boost morale around here. You know, usually a team is not exactly happy to do a lot of interviews. They're not necessarily having fun and playing games. It's usually more of an attitude of, okay, let's get in, let's get in the weight room. Let's study film. Let's get on our game plan and get ready to attack in the next week so that we don't have this same sinking feeling that we do after a loss. I think that's where the Cincinnati Bengals are right now. There certainly seems to be an emphasis and a sense of urgency to start picking it up and start winning, start being closers and making sure that they are executing on all of their assignments. Um, Personally, listening to Joe Burrow's news conferences this week, it sounds to me like he is much more comfortable playing when he does have that lead in a football game. I think for him, it opens up the offense a lot. And who wouldn't want your quarterback to be as comfortable as possible when they're trying to win you big games in big moments? And I think that's where Joe Burrow's at. Um, You will certainly take a look at the run game. We're going to take a look at the defense. I think the defense is the bright spot, obviously, of this team. Defense has been carrying this team. And that's actually kind of weird because going into this season, most of the talk did not surround the Cincinnati Bengals defense. It was heavily surrounding Joe Burrow, Joe Mixon, Tyler Boyd. We'll talk about that later as well because he has not been getting as many touches as he is used to. Um, I mean, Jamar Chase, T. Higgins. And, you know, it was surprising to me last week against the Ravens with T. Higgins out that Tyler Boyd did not receive more attention during the in the game plan or in the offensive scheme that I was expecting a lot more from that we did not see that but maybe we will in week six and I think all of the players right now know that the dam as Zach Taylor would say is going to break they are just trying to all of them collectively trying to be patient and wait for this to finally hit home this is what they've been waiting for and working so hard for and it does make sense when you see players Um, just not as happy after a loss. They put a lot uh, on the line. They work really hard and they put their bodies on the line essentially for these wins. And when you go out there and you put your body on the line, you don't come away with what you've been working for. Yeah, that puts a sour taste. And I think it would, that would put a sour taste in everybody's mouth, not just the players and the coaches. All right. So I did talk to the one and only. He does not need an introduction. I say that about like some people, but this person especially does not need an introduction because why he started this channel. James Rapine, there are so many things to start with after five weeks of, of football from the Cincinnati Bengals. Let's talk about first, we'll talk, we'll start on a positive note. What do you think about doing that? Does that sound like a good positive. idea to you? Yeah. Let's okay. be positive. What do we you got like, for me? We like positivity around here. Yeah. Um, the fact that they are incorporating um, Hayden Hurst a little mm-hmm. bit more. Yeah. I like to see that. I think that he is a valuable asset. And I think that they are showcasing that a little bit more. I Granted, I would like to see Jamar Chase more involved. I would like to see them work out something where not only Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd can be heavily involved in this offense and be successful. I am happy about the Hayden Hurst situation. What do you think about it so far? I love it. I think he's added a, a new dynamic to this offense. You know, 20 receptions, a buck 57, two touchdowns. And he's made the most of his opportunities because a lot of his catches are in the flat or they're little dump offs. Yeah. And he tends to make a guy miss or a couple of guys miss. And that was really what CJ Uzama did really well last year. Mm-hmm. And I think Hurst has been that, but he's also dynamic. Uh, a little more dynamic and you can see it. And, and so, yeah, if they keep using him this way, that it's something that either defenses are going to have to account for, or we're going to look up and Hayden Hurst is going to have 10 touchdowns <laughs> and he's going to yeah, have some, some big catches. And so, yeah, the offense hasn't done a ton right through five weeks, but the, the going and getting Hayden Hurst after Uzama left and they went after Tyler Conklin and Conklin signed where Uzama did with the jets 
and, yeah. and you settle for Hayden Hurst, well, settling might have been the best route because I, I think he does add a new dynamic to this offense, and he's been a, a bright spot through five games. He certainly does. And I, th- I think the star of this team right now, the Cincinnati Bengals, is their defensive unit as a whole. That's something to certainly be happy about. And I'll be honest, Lou Anarumo has done a hell of a job. And I understand that in his first couple of years, there were there were a lot of question marks and he was asking for the right personnel for his um, his system. And it seems like now that he has the right guys in place, they seem like they are relaxed. They are starting to take off. They are mm-hmm. playing fast and they're not having to think as much um, as they have in, in years past. This defense is a lot of fun. It, it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And, and I agree with you. It, Lou just seems to connect and see eye to eye with this entire group. And mm-hmm. whether it's a, a cast off like Eli Apple, who he obviously uh, drafted in, or helped draft with the Giants and in that connection, or someone that he did draft here in, in a, a Logan Wilson or someone they brought in in free agency in Chidobe Awuzie or Mike Hilton or insert whoever. None of those guys are superstars, right. but they just play really well together. And, yeah, I, I, I don't really see a clear weakness on this defense, even without DJ Reader. Now, have they been as good against the run without Reader? Of course not. Has the defense been as good without Reader? No, it's not going to be. But they're just – Really good at all three levels. You have a Trey Hendrickson and a Sam Hubbard on, mm-hmm. on the uh, that, that starting front behind them. Logan Wilson is a beast, and yeah, Jermaine probably. Pratt is as steady as they come. And the secondary, everyone likes to talk about how Eli Apple is like this, you know, sore, bad play, whatever. Man, a lot of teams yeah. could use Eli Apple uh, in their secondary, including the New Orleans Saints, by the way. And I know Saints fans are going to hate True. hearing that, but this week. The Saints would love to have Eli Apple on their team to help guard these Bengals wide receivers. So, no, I, I love that they've gotten the right pieces, and I think Lou's doing a, an excellent job so far. And there is room to improve. I know they're getting a lot of praise. I think the good thing is, is as well as they're playing, there are things they can improve on. And, and so we might not have seen the, the absolute best of this defense yet, which is, is certainly exciting. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think that we've seen the best yet. I think there's a lot more left in the tank as far as the potential for this defensive unit. And before we even start breaking down week six between the Bengals and the Saints, I want to touch on one more thing because I found it very interesting. Um, You know, when you are working with someone and they're messing up, if you don't care about their success or you don't necessarily like them, you're not going to pull them aside and say, hey, you're messing up here. I need you like get it together. We need you to thrive. <laughs> and when I saw the Bengals fail on that fourth down conversion on Sunday night and LaL Collins was running off the field and Zach Taylor was running with him and physically had to grab his jersey to get his attention to let him know that he was messing up. I was happy to see that. Because if it wasn't a big deal and, it, and Zach didn't care about L. Collins improving or executing on that, on that play in the future, then he wouldn't have bothered with it. He would have let somebody else handle it. Mm-hmm. But it was so important that the top, the head coach, made sure to stop him and have a conversation with him on the sidelines. It was, it was vital to him at that point. And that says I, a lot to me. I, I'm glad you pointed that out because – That's gotten lost in the shuffle, and I don't think I've commented on this really anywhere. Maybe on Locked on Bengals after the game briefly, maybe. And I don't even think, you know, that was necessarily the topic A, B, or C at the time. (laughs) There was a lot. I, 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 Yeah, there was. I agree with you, and I love to see that from Zach because Zach Taylor is a very hands-off coach. Mm -hmm. All off-season, right? It was, "Ah, we're going to take it nice and light. It was a really long year. And to me, I was like, Ooh, this is great. It's, it's nice and light. You call off practice, do everything. Cause it was a long year yeah. for the media as well as the players. So I was fine with that. But at some point you still have to be the head coach and it isn't just a, it, it is a dictatorship at the end of the day. And it doesn't have to be all the time, but mm-hmm. there are certain times where it's shut up. Listen, I'm the coach. And that was an emotional moment where Lyle Collins was, 
pissed. Mm -hmm. He was frustrated probably by the call, which everybody was. He was frustrated because he lost on that play, which, and he chose wrong and he got it wrong. Yeah. And so after the game, we asked him about it and he said, yeah, I was just trying to tell him I'm, I'm okay. I'm good. I'm good. And Zach didn't want to hear that. Zach wanted right. to say, Hey, <laughs> this is what you did wrong. And I love seeing that because yeah, you can't too. do that all the time, but when you do it, it could stick. Mm -hmm. And that's the part of it where hopefully it sticks with Lael. Hopefully other players on the team see that because Lael Collins doesn't practice every Wednesday. That's something right. that they have built in. Yeah, he's in, got right? that that day. Yeah. And, and so it's like, oh, well, well, Zach can be hard on Lyle too. Lyle's not just skating, right? right. He's going yeah, to get, get screened at too. And, and I'm sure that's happened, but to do it on a primetime stage, I, I agree with you. I think that matters, and I think people paid attention to it and in a good way. I think that has a positive effect on the locker room. Well, and I, I think as a, as a head coach, you've got to choose your moments when to do things like that and have those conversations and pull guys aside in front of people. And I, I think that there would have been not heavy criticism. Maybe nobody really would have noticed on the outside, but I think guys on the inside of the organization would have noticed if he did not, uh, you know, execute his assignment and no one said anything to him. Mm -hmm. People would have noticed, especially within the offensive line room. No doubt. No doubt. It, you know, in yeah. these young guys would notice. Cordell Volson would notice. Right. Jackson Carmen would notice. And I know people are tossing him and say, he's still a young guy. He's, still, he's younger than Cordell. He's 22. Cordell's 24. Uh, no doubt about it. And, and so you want to see that. You, you want it to happen. And sometimes it's good. And sometimes you grow from it. So you, you hope that's what happens from this, is they grow from it, learn from it. And look, I, I think Lel Collins, he's taking a lot of heat right now. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of it's deserved. I get it. At this, because he's not playing great. At right. the same time, I, I don't know if people think he's like faking this back issue. But yeah. if you watch him, he's clearly a guy that's playing through something. This isn't right. just how he moved. If you watch him last year in Dallas, it was just last year. It wasn't eight years ago. It, it, and so I, I think he's playing through a back issue and he also had his best game uh, of the year. wasn't great, but his best game, his best game certainly in pass protection on Sunday. So yeah. hopefully he continues to uh, to inch better, get a little healthier, and we see the best from Lyle Collins moving forward. Yeah, I hope so too. I think I think the bye week is going to do. Hopefully, it will do wonders for him as far as healing up that injury because, of course, he's going to play through it. He's kind of. He's kind of in a position where he has to play through it. And the, and the Cincinnati Bengals, I don't believe, especially the front office, is not going to shell out the type of money that they did for him if they didn't think that he was a quality, adequate player. For sure. I, I, and They've made that mistake a few times already, I think. I would hope that they have learned from those mistakes. <laughs> look, you can question a lot about Collins, right? The, the health factor, the Bengals certainly did that. That's why he has a lot of per game bonuses and things like that and mm -hmm. all of those things. But to me, when you watch him on the field, when he's healthy, he's one of those dudes. And he's yeah. one of those dudes you want blocking for Burrow. And I, I don't think that guy's gone. I don't think he just fell off a cliff yet. I think he's dealing with this back issue. And anyone that's had back issues, like even if it's like a tweak, it's really hard to move and bend and twist and do all of those things. And so I, I think he's trying to get healthy as the season goes along, which is a really, really challenging thing Tough. to do. Yeah. But the mini buy appeared to help some. So hopefully these Wednesdays off some, some rest, you know, light days on Thursday, light day on Friday, by the time Sunday rolls around, hopefully he's feeling pretty good and, and can give the Bengals, you know, a boost, especially this week, because who knows what's going to happen with that right. left tackle position. So you're going to need Collins to play well at right tackle. Yeah, absolutely. And I know, I know Jonah Williams is playing through an injury and I, I, I he's just that kind of dude also that he's just going to go out there. He's not going to complain. He's going to go out there and do his best possible job that he can while he's hurting, but he'll also be one of those guys who says, if, if you ask him about it, he'll be one of those guys that says everybody's banged up at this point. We all mm -hmm. just play through it. So I feel like that would be the answer if you asked him about it. Yeah, yeah, I think he's going to try. I, I do. Yeah. You know, he, he dislocated his kneecap. Um, mm -hmm. That's more more of an MCL thing at this stage because the, the kneecap popped back in. I know there was a lot of swelling on Monday. It, it literally it popped out and popped back in Oof. on the field. 
For the average so Joe, like, that would be like brutal. It's br- <laughs> it, 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 brutal, right? It, it's, and he still played, of course. They, they and uh, they put that brace on him, and so he made it sound like it's more about getting the swelling down and, and seeing mm-hmm. if he can move and all of those things. I think he's got a shot. I, I do. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those where I could totally see him not practicing at all, not even on Friday, uh, tomorrow. And then Sunday, they fly him down at Sunday, they give it a go. And he's like, I can do this, but, you know, I, I'll be able to do it. And maybe you do that for a little bit for a, a couple of weeks with him and, and he plays on game day and doesn't practice at all through the week. I, Sometimes you do that with guys, and he's a veteran. He knows what he needs to do, so maybe that's the route they go this week. Hopefully he's good to go, though, because if not, it could be Akeem Adenogy. It could be someone like that. And I'm not knocking them, but they aren't Jonah Williams. Right. It's still not your starting left tackle that you <laughs> that you paid a lot of money for. Um, and I've we've been super positive in this so far. We've kept the morale right. up. Right, we can switch. I, mean, I feel like we're they doing a really good three. job at that. And I, they but are two and three, at least. So here we go. Oh, All right. Something that drove me crazy, and I will never understand it. I don't understand this more than I don't understand why they can't beat cover two or Tampa two defenses. The Philly special, James. <laughs> come on, you've got Joe Burrow as your quarterback. Why in the hell would you take the ball out of his hands? Yeah. What? I mean, no disrespect to Tyler Boyd. None yeah. whatsoever. Fantastic player. Fantastic human. It's Joe Burrow. Mm-hmm. You're going to take the ball out of his hands and be cute and tricksy in that situation? I mean, if it worked out, we would all be in awe. But the the reality of it is that it didn't work out whatsoever. No. It, it didn't work out. And I don't think it was necessarily needed. Right? right. So. In, in the Super Bowl, it worked with Joe Mixon, right? Yeah. You know why you need a gadget play like that? Oh, well, it's still Joe Burrow quarterback, but your offensive line was getting crushed. Absolutely <laughs> crushed. Like, it, it was ridiculous what yeah. was happening to your offensive line. So guess what you needed throughout the playoffs is gimmicks, flashes, yeah. anything to get by and scratch and claw your way. And they came within this close of, of winning the whole damn thing. And so, yes – that's the thing is, well, Sunday they were blocking fine. Burrow was under pressure, but not too much pressure. Yeah. He had time Unless to throw. been in his career. And, and so, yeah, the Philly special is the Nick Foles special. It's what you do when Nick Foles is going up yes. against Tom Brady, and you need to really put, it, put the pressure on Tom Brady and that Patriots offense. And so it was a heck of a call at the time. But everyone's seen the Philly special now. Everyone. Yeah. And they've seen it over and over and over again. And it's almost like I remember like an 09, 2010, it, maybe it was 07, 08. The Wildcat like went crazy and yeah, then every team started to do it and then it died. <laughs> well, now it works a little bit here and there. Saquon Barkley's running, but you can't do it a ton. Right. And I just think it's kind of overplayed. Not, I agree with you. That's the play that really set them back mm-hmm. on that drive and in, in, in that sequence that everyone's been critical of at the same time. And you'll probably ask about it. I didn't like that fourth down call either. I didn't either. I don't I really <laughs> <laughs> I mean, or I know you're shocked that I didn't I didn't appreciate that. I don't think a lot of Bengals fans, by the way, appreciated that. Yeah. There were questionable play calls. And one thing that I was confused about, and I spoke with um you and like outside of the, you know, the cameras about this was you know, the fact that the tune seems to have changed a little bit where at the beginning, Zach was saying, you know, I'm the play caller, Brian and Brian Callahan, and I handle that. But then on Monday, to me, maybe I'm taking this the wrong way. So like, tell me if I'm taking it the wrong way. But to me on Monday, when he said that it's a collective and everyone is, you know, involved in calling the plays, Mm -hmm. it seemed to me like he was throwing his staff under the bus a little bit. I, did, yeah. I wasn't a fan of that. Yeah, I, I, look. And I'm not trying to get on the guy. I like Zach no, Taylor, but that I just didn't like that. It's, it felt different it, from the tune he's been displaying. I know I know. Brian handles a lot of the the stuff throughout the week, and, and he always has. And so, for sure, it, it, it is a collaborative effort. But at the same time, in, to, to say, well, it's, it's going to be the same call no matter who's saying it. Well, that's that's not true. I mean, it, yeah. it's just not because it, 
there's a game plan element and that's why I was critical of the shovel pass. It wasn't the play call. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that the game plan element, that was one of their got to have it plays, got to have it moments around the goal line and the shovel pass to Stanley Morgan was in there. I'm not, not knocking, not <laughs> knocking Stanley Morgan either. By well, the he way. said he He's, hadn't even practiced it really. He, it, yeah. It was, it was, <laughs> it was installed this past week prior to yeah. the game. And by the way, Zach brought up, Oh, well, the, it worked to, to Tyler Boyd. No, it didn't. It didn't work to Tyler Boyd against the Jets because Volson was called for holding. So there's a holding call. They, they ran it again another time, and it, it was short of the line to gain. So I hate shovel passes. I think shovel passes are ridiculous. I don't care if they work for Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. That's fine. Their offensive line is insane, and Travis yeah, Kelsey is different. And it, shovel passes are just – you can win without them. I would yes. never call a shovel pass for the rest of time. <laughs> um, but, but to get to what you were saying about the collaborative effort, it, it's always been that, but I don't like the fact that he said, you know, at the end of it, at the end of that, he was like, so it doesn't matter who, well, it does because maybe Brian Callahan doesn't call the shovel pass there. And instead he calls one of the other got to have it plays. So it does matter, mm -hmm. but his overall point I do think is a good one because if they switch play callers, which everybody was talking about this week, right. if it went from Zach Taylor to Brian Callahan. You don't think Zach Taylor's going to have say in the game plan? You don't think Dan Pitcher's going to have some say? And so, correct. And he's an offensive mind. And so that's the part of it. He, this is something that the staff needs to grow, the, the, mm -hmm. the entire staff. It's not just Zach, it, it, but they all have to get better. And so Zach should take the heat. He's the head coach, no doubt about it. But it's not just Zach that needs to improve because, well, let's be honest here, I don't know if a, a goal line Philly special or – the shovel, pla shovel, shovel pass. pass should have been a part of the game plan going into the week five. Well, and James, here's the thing that I don't think that a lot of people realize, especially the the fans on social media and stuff, is when they call for Zach Taylor's job, they want Zach Taylor to be fired. And in that situation, I, I would not go towards wanting the head coach to be fired midseason unless – they're able to keep the rest of the staff intact and who knows what would happen with that. And this is all just hypothetical. This is nothing concrete or official, but when you fire a head coach and you bring somebody else in, if they don't have the exact same playbook, if they don't have the exact same terminology, the players are not going to be as playing as fast. They're not going to execute as quickly. They're not going to be as successful at that because then they have to turn around and learn new mm -hmm. terminology. They have to learn another playbook. So it's not in the players. It's not in Joe Burrow's best interest to fire Zach Taylor, in my opinion. No. And look, they're not even. No, he just that, signed a new deal or something he, like in the offseason. So they he, did, anyway. he, he did after after the run to the Super Bowl, which I don't want yeah. people to forget. Okay? Right, yes. People the, <laughs> the Bengals were in the Super Bowl this year. All right, so they might be two and three now. But I'm a big – and this was kind of a, a criticism last year during this time and, and certainly in 2020 and even at the end of the Marvin era. But I'm a big equity guy. So yeah. if you do a lot of good things, you build equity. And slowly, you can cash that in if you have a failure here, a failure there. If you mess up there, you mess up here. Because if you're consistent most of the time, right. then I know you're going to be consistent even if when you mess up or you're late or you whatever. And I'm just tying regular life into to coaching. Well, he went to the freaking Super Bowl. There is a little equity here. There is a little <laughs> wiggle room because the Cincinnati freaking Bengals hadn't won a playoff game in my life until Mine January. either. It, yeah. And so I, I'm not saying he gets to live off that forever. Not. And I'm not saying people shouldn't be critical, but there hasn't been one time. And I was extremely critical as were you of Zach Taylor uh, during 2020 uh, mm -hmm. when I covered him in 2019 because it was bad and there was a lot of growing pains, but that hasn't even crossed my mind as far as a new head coach. The, the dude was in Super Bowl 56 and they were, Look, if Quentin Spain forces Aaron Donald inside to Trey Hopkins, by the way, two offensive linemen, neither one is even on a practice squad right now, and I like both guys. Just telling you the state of the Bengals' offensive right. line and where it was in February. If he forces him inside to Hopkins, we might be talking about what we could be talking about as Bengals fans know, bro, to chase one of the craziest plays in Super Bowl history, maybe the best play in Super Bowl history. It didn't happen, but he was that close. So – I'm going to lighten it up a little bit 
when it comes to the people that are saying that. And that's why I've never even addressed it until now, because I, I think it's kind of silly. Yeah. And, and so does he need to figure some things out? Absolutely. Uh, this offensive staff does, and it starts with Zach Taylor. And we'll see if he can figure those things out, including the cover two beaters that he needs to figure <laughs> James, out. James, my week. gosh, please. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, oh. I'm not even going to dig into that because I could spend 20 minutes on some on stuff like that. So I'm not going to dig in with that, but <laughs> let's, let's try to, let's try to switch this or else I'm going to go on a tangent week six. Yeah. It's the, what is it? The fourth road game in five weeks for mm-hmm. the Cincinnati Bengals playing against potentially Andy Dalton. I cannot, I really like Andy Dalton as a person and I think that he is talented otherwise he would not still be on an NFL roster but when you compare his talent to Joe Burrows I cannot I can really can't fathom a world where Andy Dalton is 2-0 and against a Joe Burrow led team that would be utterly insane um agreed I can't and we both covered Andy <laughs> for yes, quite did. some time and I'll say it, Andy Dalton has no business, no business going 2-0 and against Joe Burrow. He had no business no, going 1-0 and against Joe Burrow. Right. And yet he did and, and helped the Bears do that last year in week two. And he wasn't mm-hmm. able to finish the game, but it was a big reason why they won it. Look, it, it, whether it's Andy Dalton or Jameis Winston, because I think there is a chance Jameis plays, the Bengals have the quarterback advantage, clear cut. Mm-hmm. Joe Burrow is better than either of those guys. Right. And even with the way he's playing, by the way, because people have been critical, including myself, of the way Burrow's played, he's still playing like at like not 2015 level Andy Dalton, but like pretty solid high end Andy Dalton, right? And so it's like, <laughs> okay, like Burrow's bad is still, you, you know, even Andy after, Dalton's best it, day is what you're trying to say. To it, close to it. Yeah. yeah. It, maybe not best day, but close to it. Cause I think bros for him really struggling right now, but if he gets to where I expect him to be on Sunday, which is back in the Superdome, back in Louisiana at the mm-hmm. place where him and Jamar chase won a national championship, the same building. I expect him to have a big day and maybe it's unfair because they're, they're searching a bit, but I just do. I think Joe Burrow's too talented to continue to have these, these kind of dud games, these like slow moving, slow start, just un Joe Burrow like games where he's just a little off, a tick off, not as accurate, doesn't look as comfortable. I think that changes this week. And and so I have high expectations for him. And so if he plays at the level he's supposed to play at, they we aren't going to be talking about Andy Dalton being two and oh. Put it that way. And I'm not trying to jinx the Bengals or anything like that. But at some point, this Bengals team needs to figure it out. And Burrow's shown he can overcome, you know, questionable play calling or questionable game decisions. He did it last year, plenty. And so, yes, absolutely. Worst case, uh, he needs to do it again on Sunday. Yeah, I think he, I think he certainly does, and I think, I think eventually things will start breaking better for the Cincinnati Bengals. I know that they are having a heck of a lot of trouble with current ways that the opponents are playing them defensively. But I do think that that breaks eventually and they do figure out how to get Jamar Chase more involved with his offense without taking those reps from Tyler Boyd, because Tyler Boyd is still a very good threat as well. A good weapon to use. Um, I will say oh, here's another positive. How, how am I finding all of these positive James? I have no idea. I love it. <laughs> Here we are. But Joe Mixon averaging 5.4 yards per carry last week. Not super stellar, didn't eclipse a 100 yards rushing, but it's better than three. Mm -hmm. It's better than two and a half. It's better than two. So, yes, that is an improvement in my eyes. And I I saw Mm -hmm. some decent runs from Joe Mixon on Sunday night. And I think that he does continue to get better, especially in week six against the Saints. You'd certainly love to see it. And he showed a little bit of burst, a little bit of edginess that I hadn't seen since week one against the Steelers. And I I think that ankle was bothering him more than he let on last week, no doubt. And and so it was good to see that, see that he still had a little juice left. And and, and I know that sounds weird to say, but it it just looked, it was really bad weeks two through four. 
And so, yeah, yeah hopefully they can build on that. And th they changed the way they were blocking and run blocking for him. And I think it's more favorable to this offensive line. So we'll see. You know, we'll see if they can continue to build on that. But that is going to go a long way and go hand in hand. Let's tie a positive into one of your negatives and one of everybody's negatives. If they run the ball like that, you can't keep playing that deep zone if you're giving up five and a half yards of carry. You just can't because that's going to open up play action stuff. You're going to be able to get these guys quick dump offs. And that's really what they should do. If they can run the ball effectively and just dump it off, Burrow should be Brady. Burrow should be Brady with the Patriots. <laughs> Brady with the Patriots threw it to uh, James White, Julian Adam, all these guys, and it was all around the line of scrimmage. And, yeah. and he would do that, dates, and then, yeah. boom, it would be Gronk up the seam. And, and they didn't have a Jamar Chase or a T. Higgins. Um, but I'm glad you mentioned Tyler Boyd because I look at these Tyler Boyd numbers. Hayden Hurst has 20 receptions. Boyd has 15, right? And he's averaging 15 and a half yards a catch. And, and he's made some big plays. The problem is, is T. Higgins now was dinged up, in, you know, three in three games mm -hmm. where he, he left with the concussion. He got dinged up uh, on that, that Thursday night game and, and then came back and played through it a little bit. But then m missed all of last game, essentially. And Boyd was a non-factor. They need to find a way to get Boyd involved. And, and I don't know exactly what that is. But right now there's so much pressure on Jamar Chase and they have other weapons, and it doesn't really feel like it when Higgins isn't out there. And it should, because they have a guy named Tyler Boyd who's a, a real threat in the slot and, and can make a, a huge difference when he's not playing quarterback. Yeah, I mean, I, there's so many weapons on this offense. I want to see all of them utilized to their best of their talent and ability. I just think it's taking longer than we were expecting because of last year. We were expecting, you know, a buzzsaw fire offense, and we're just not seeing that right now. But you also have to realize that defensive coordinators in this league are pretty smart, and mm -hmm. they will figure out how to stop your best weapons. And speaking of smart defensive coordinators, Lou Anarumo, he's got an insane weapon to stop on Sunday because Taysom Hill, not only did he throw a touchdown, he rushed for three more. Yeah. I mean, yep. can I don't I don't think it's possible to actually stop a guy like Taysom Hill. I think when you're defending a guy like Taysom Hill, you have to just contain him. If that makes sense. It, so, I, you just have to make sure he doesn't blow you out of the water. Yeah, he he's going to get touches. They're going to manufacture touches for him and you know, I I think this Bengals defense is in a good position to stop a guy like Taysom Hill because what he does, he does apply pressure on you, but the missed tackles, right? That, that's something that he, he'll just make you miss or yeah. he's, he's big and strong enough to stiff arm you or run through you. These Bengals have been really good tackling. And I, I thought they did a great job on Lamar Jackson this past week for the most part. Yeah. And, and just overall, for a team that doesn't tackle in camp at all, like zero, and <laughs> doesn't play in the preseason, they've been great at tackling. And so yes. w w however they're working on it, whatever virtual simulation it, that they're doing – it's working, but I agree with you. Taysom Hill is this weird, it, and, and I think there's going to be a game plan, or a, uh, he's going to be in their game plan on offense regardless, but especially if Andy Dalton's at quarterback, I think there's going to be uh, an even deeper Taysom Hill package that Lou Anarumo and this defense, or yeah, this defense is going to have to be ready for because if not, especially with the injuries the Saints are dealing with right now, Hill could be a, a huge part of that game plan. Yeah, I think I think stopping him is big. Running the ball is big. And then, of course, I mean, Joe Burrow says this every single week. You know he wants to start fast because in his mind, that completely opens up his options offensively. Um, so starting fast, I think, is one of the biggest things that they should um, go for, but strictly because your quarterback, your star, your franchise player wants that to happen because he mm -hmm. is more comfortable playing in a game where he has the lead and they've started fast. And, and the other thing here in the Superdome and with a bunch of rowdy Saints fans, and there's going to be yeah. a lot of them and they're going to be excited. Some of them might even be wearing Joe Burrow LSU jerseys, but guess what? <laughs> when the game starts, yeah, but they won't be, and they're going to be rooting against the Bengals. And so what better way to take the crowd out in a dome that gets really, 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 really loud than get off to a fast start. 
and let everybody know. Like, think about it. If you get off to a fast start against the Saints, they're going to be like, oh, my God. Andy Dalton's our quarterback. Or, oh, my God. The doubt Jameis, is creeping in. <laughs> J- Jameis, can't, Jameis can't do this. He's not – or Taysom Hill isn't going to – he's not getting any running room right now. Like, if you just overwhelm them, it's like, ah, oh, well, of course, they're the, the defending AFC champions. Like, that, that will creep into the crowd, and then the crowd won't be as loud, and then you won't have as many communication issues when you have to go to that silent count. It, it'll be easier on Akeem Adeniji if he does have to start at left tackle. You know, whatever the case is, it just helps in so many areas when you're on the road especially. And, you know, I, I think it will take some pressure. These guys should be feeling pressure right now. It'll take yeah. some pressure off of this offense. I, I think back, you know how much pressure was on Jamar Chase week one last year? Yeah, and he caught a ball wasn't on catching anything in practice. Was it, wasn't Maybe. catching anything. And it was just like, you know, you had Mike Florio talking about how ah, Jamar's going to end up in the XFL and all of these <laughs> things, right? It was just insane. Just going to the extreme. Just extreme football league. Just insane, yeah. right? And, uh, and so Jamar <laughs> caught a pass on the sideline, his first NFL catch. It was on the far side from the press box on, on the visitor side. Um, and, and he caught his probably 12-yard, 14-yard gain. And then he catches the touchdown right before the half. And you know what that did? That set the tone for the entire year. Yeah. That play. It, it just changed everything. And it just, the pressure was just, well, the Bengals, wow. they've won games, right? They beat the Jets. Mm-hmm. It wasn't sexy. <laughs> have any of their wins been yeah. necessarily sexy? Their losses have been. It, 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 and, they, <laughs> and they beat the Dolphins, but Tua goes down. And, you know, they win, but it. They were down in the fourth, and then they come back, and they end up winning by double digits. And it's just, it, it was like, a, all right, yeah, let, let's go. Now we're two and two. Let's catch our breath, and let's handle business against the Ravens. And they just, they didn't. So they haven't had that, that Jamar Chase moment on offense that mm-hmm. just takes the pressure off. And, and so I, I think they need to have that on Sunday. If they're going to go on a run, which they need to go on a run here if you look at their schedule. So we'll see, we'll see if they can have that moment. And James, one last thing that I want to address with you. I, we've been we've been on this Bengals rant back and forth for over half an hour. One last thing that I want to talk to you about. Our dear friend, Ben Baby, with, I, I think this might have happened two weeks ago, James, where he was mm-hmm. in the press conference, Joe Burrow's up at the podium, and he coughs, and it, <laughs> it makes chocolate. It's um Ben, it's, did he have COVID? It, did, was he like I'm not trying to start rumors, I'm not gonna say that, but what what was his deal? I'm gonna bring him uh, a pack of cough drops next time. He is the most dramatic human being <laughs> ever. That's this why dude, we love him though. This dude is so dr- <laughs> and so that's what it was. It was the dramatic cough, the the breath leaving his body, the <gasps> and and, and Joe's like, oh my God, what's going on over there? Like that's, it, it's just typical Ben trying to steal the show. Joe Burrow's trying to talk. It's his news conference and Ben baby wants to make it about him. And then somehow here's the conspiracy theory. How does it take two weeks for this to get out? I don't it, know. How did you know it, how? how did it Cause take Ben two? baby, did he, leak it? He, he put it out there <laughs> and leaked it cause he wanted to make it about him and talk about it. Look at Ben just going viral, viral, viral. Um, no, Ben's my guy. I, I, I give him grief all the time. Yeah, but, it's uh, great. It is, uh, it, it is hilarious. I didn't, I was in the room, I believe. Maybe there's one borough news conference I missed. I'm on the short week, I missed one. That might have been the short week one where I wasn't there in person. Oh, um, okay. So, so that might have been that one. And uh, man, it, uh, it made Joe Burrow jump. Joe Burrow's well, probably like, was that was <laughs> Micah Parsons? Like, that's how dramatic Ben <laughs> Baby was there, man. No, one of the things that I love most about this is that on social media, the his team, Joe Burrow's teammates, are sharing it and laughing their butts off at the video oh. of Joe being startled from Ben's cough. It is so funny. I just love that they're all getting a kick out of it. Like even though they're two and three and they lost last week, they're still finding funny ways to jab each other. I like yeah. that about this team. Yeah, it, it. That's the thing is they have stayed together. And, yeah. and they obviously had a bunch of expectations. You start 0-2, and, and the message on record, off record, you know, was was the same. 
and they weren't mm-hmm. pointing fingers. And I, I think they're going to turn a corner. The problem is, is where's that corner? Is the corner this weekend or is it three weeks from now? Because if it's three oh. weeks from now, it might be too late. And so yeah. th- they have to turn that corner soon. They absolutely do because three weeks will be way too late. And then they're going to, I mean, they're going to be in a deeper hole than they already are. And that's just not acceptable for a team that has the type of talent that they have on this Bengals roster. You just, you can't get into a hole that deep with this talent. It's nuts. And they only have James a limited amount of time with this exact roster, especially with the key positions locked up. So Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate uh, you joining me. And are you going to Louisiana? I never, I didn't, I haven't oh. asked you that yet. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I it's figured. Gumbo City. I'm about to gain 22 <laughs> pounds. I, I, I've asked Jamar Chase the best restaurants to go to, and and, and also multiple other people. I'm going to catch up with Catherine Terrell, who used to cover the Bengals. Yes, used to be I like the her ben a lot. Baby. She's awesome. Uh, so yeah, I, I haven't even texted her and told her I'm going to catch up with her, but I know she has something planned with the beat rider. So. Uh, I'm going to be able to see her and uh, eat all of the food, all of the food. This shirt's already tied on me. It's probably not going to fit when I get back. So we'll see. You are going to have to be binging on the built bars when you come back. Make sure to trim yourself back down after that trip. Yeah. The the training this week in between trips has been pretty, pretty intense. So we're trying. (laughs) I bet. (laughs) <laughs> James, like, I will say one thing. The last time I was in New Orleans, which unfortunately was for five years, six years, maybe. I've never been ID'd as much as I was in that city going out. Wow. Okay. Never in my life. So, so make sure ID you have ready. your ID handy. Yes. You, you know, it's going to suck when no one IDs me. That's how I know I look old. That'll be the thing. Uh, I, said you were going to get ID'd everywhere and you didn't get ID'd <laughs> anywhere, dude. What's I'm going to make a you? bet with Andrew Fox Miller on how many times you get ID'd. We'll see if I win some money. Oh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I, you never know what Andrew's going to say. So, I have no doubt that James Rapine will get carded quite a lot in New Orleans this weekend. And a few notes from practice today. Jonah Williams and T. Higgins both working on the rehab field trying to get right for week six. Jonah Williams had that injury where his kneecap was out of place and then they popped it back into place. So obviously a lot of pain associated with that. So he's got a lot of work to do if he is going to play on Sunday and make sure that he can play in a way where he doesn't further injure himself and make sure that he is, you know, viable and usable throughout the rest of the season. You don't want to, you know, put him out there in a situation where it's just week six against the New Orleans Saints, and then he does further damage, and then he's out for the rest of the season. No one wants to see that. So he's a game-time decision, I would expect, and we will have everything covered for you on Sunday, and we'll have more for you next week on the OT at 8 o'clock.